Yeah, and so then when was your first like exposure to code then? Uh, I was about six. Oh, okay, yes. much before the biology Way days. before the biology career, yeah. My grandparents were computer programmers. So my dad's father was uh, in the Navy for many years. He actually graduated from the Naval Academy during World War II. And so what, wait, wait a second, what time period is this that you're, yeah, you're programmers? My grandparents were, were programmers in the early 70s. In the early 70s, wow. Yep, in the punch card days. Wow. Yeah, and they were programming satellites. So, um, That's so cool. Yeah, programming satellites in space. I think my, my uh, grandmother was doing more like TV programs, and my grandfather might have been more on the classified end of things. But yeah, they were doing programming for satellites. Hey, uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm Mark Urbanski, CEO of Front of Masters. And today I'm speaking with Jen Kramer. Jen has been a developer kind of in, through a lot of the stages of the internet. So we get to talk about how things kind of evolved over the years, as well as she became an instructor at the Harvard Extension School. So she has a lot of experience teaching early uh you know, people getting into web development and into the career. So she has a lot of great advice, great anecdotes, and it's just a really fun conversation. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. I'm Jen. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Jen. <laughs> great to see you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. So the way this is going to work, we're going to start out with uh, warm-up questions. We're going to go into your early career and teaching and then kind of the current career and some future stuff. Yeah. So how does that sound? Sounds totally awesome. All right. So warm up question. Are there any special skills that you have that people wouldn't normally know about? Well, most people don't know that I am actually a musician. So I have been playing flute ever since I was 10 years old. And um, I it is a way that I get out of the house in the evenings. When you work from home, it is important to have some kind of activity that gets you out of the house and gets you talking to people who are not computer geeks. Now I get out and I talk to music geeks. So uh, it's really great. I get out, meet new people and, and get to make some music and have some fun. That's since you're 10. I've, I've heard yeah. that you might actually be performing. Oh yeah. These days. Absolutely. Play wow. all kinds of places. Yeah. Last weekend it was at a cocktail party. And uh, the weekend before that, the Watertown Arts Festival had us, uh, uh, my flute group, play uh, on stage for everybody who wanted to listen. And, of course, you can't play Bach and Mozart and things like that. So we played Bohemian Rhapsody and we played YMCA and Barbara Ann and Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy and other various exciting tunes. We arranged for a whole bunch of flutes. Oh, I'm imagining yeah. what that sounds like with flutes. It's quite a sound. And I've never heard of a flute group. Can you yeah. talk about that? Like, yeah. Yeah, because everybody thinks that there's just one flute that's the one that you see played at, you know, Liz, the one that Lizzo plays, for example. But uh, there are actually many sizes. you got the tiny little piccolo, which you hear on Stars and Stripes Forever. Then, then you get to bigger flutes. So there's alto flute, bass flute, contrabass flute, double contrabass flute. We can actually span the entire range of the piano keyboard with just flutes. Wow, so you could have... In theory, an entire orchestra. That's and just and we do. Yep. Every summer, there's a group for the Metropolitan Flute Orchestra there in Boston, and we get together like 80 flute players on a stage. Wow. And then we rearrange, you know, Night on Bald Mountain by Mazursky for 80 different flutes of all sizes. Yeah. Super fun. Are there videos of that? There, out there? are. I there definitely are. need to check that out. I will, I will point you to some videos where you can check us out. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Um, before getting into coding, I heard that you're actually a biology major. I was. And you started your career there. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I had thought about being a music major, and everybody in my life was trying to talk me out of it. But I took AP Biology in high school, and I really loved it. So I decided to become a biology major when I was in college. And this, of course, was kind of before the web. <laughs> so there really was no web uh, to be focused on. I could have been a computer science major or something. Uh, but biology was really great. And uh, I focused on that. And then I worked in a lab for a while. Uh, I, and I got into science business. I traveled around the world modeling um, 3D imaging through microscopes with a Pentium 5 computer and, you know, a bunch of things hanging off the sides of microscopes. Um, took a lot of pictures through microscopes. 
won the MyCon Small World Contest, believe it or not, at one point in time, 1994. Wow. And yeah. what was that about? Or? So Nikon every year has a, uh, the, what they call the Small World Contest, which mm -hmm. are pictures that are taken through the microscope. And um, I think I got like eighth place and 15th place and an honorable mention that year. So I am in the calendar for 1994. And what were you taking pictures of then? Uh, cells, uh, just cells through the microscope that had been labeled with various kinds of fluorescent dyes. So um, you use a bunch of different filters in the microscope to take these pictures. So it's got like a black background and it's got, uh, you know, br bright, bright colors, usually red, green, blue kind of things. So what's the secret to placing high in a competition like that? I, I think I was just really lucky at that point okay. in time. Uh, now it's quite competitive because the contest has continued to this day. And if you to look at it online, it's amazing the pictures that people are taking these days. For sure. The cameras are much better. I was using film in those days, like triple exposures on one frame of film. Um, wow. And that was before that cameras had gotten good enough that you could get really good resolution uh, as you can now. Yeah. And so then when was your first like exposure to code then? Uh, I was about six. Oh, okay. yes. much before the biology Way days. before the biology career. Yeah. My grandparents were computer programmers. So my dad's father was uh, in the Navy for many years. He actually graduated from the Naval Academy during World War II. And so what, wait, wait a second. What time period is this that you're yeah, you programmers. my grandparents were, were programmers in the early 70s. In the early 70s, wow. Yep, in the punch card days. Wow. Yeah, and they were programming satellites. So, um, That's so cool. Yeah, programming satellites in space. I think my, my uh, grandmother was doing more like TV programs, and my grandfather might have been more on the classified end of things. But, yeah, they were doing programming for satellites. So uh, my grandfather bought a Heath kit. Uh, kit for a personal computer around like 76, 78, something like that, and uh, put it together. So if you're not familiar with Heathkit, it was a whole brand of a bunch of different products that you make like a crystal radio and, and some other kinds of things. And you would assemble these things into various types of electronic gizmos. So this was the one for the personal computer. So it involved like welding circuit boards and all kinds of things. And, uh, so he would pack up this computer into his car and then drive on over to see us and unpack it. And my brothers and I would beat each other up trying to figure out who was going to be the next one to get to play on the computer. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot to do. Yeah, I was going to say, what was playing <laughs> on the computer? Is yeah. It's like adding numbers or what? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much that kind of thing. Like, uh, because, of course, this was uh, a very tiny screen. It was It was monochrome. There were no graphics. It was just a command line. So... You know, my grandmother taught us basic. So here's line 10, print Jennifer, line 20, go to line 10. And your name would show up over and over again on the screen, which was mind-blowing for a six-year-old. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, so that's how we got started, my brothers and I uh, beating each other up to play on our grandparents' computer. Uh, in the 70s. In the, in the late 70s and early 80s. Early yep. 80s. Wow. Yep. Yep. Yeah, my grandmother uh, passed away in 2006. I think I'm, she was moving maybe around 2001. She still had that computer. And I, I told her, you should really donate that to the Smithsonian. They were living in the D.C. area. She thought I was joking. Uh, I, I'm sorry that they didn't. I don't know what happened to that computer. But that would have been one of those things that would have been nice to have in the Smithsonian. Um, Absolutely. Because, yeah, because how many hand-assembled computers from that time are there at this point in time? Right, right. Yeah. How about your, like, discovery of the web, mm. you know, because you talked about the early programming, but I think you got into programming through the web, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee in invented the web uh, around 1989, and he was working at the CERN Institute in Switzerland. So he was part of a scientific program. And uh, one of the goals at that point in time, it was 1989, uh, scientists are always trying to communicate with each other all over the world. And the Berlin Wall had only just come down at that point in time, or just about to come down. It was 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down. So it was really difficult to communicate with scientists on the other side of the Iron Curtain, so to speak. So the web became a way that scientists originally were just going to be able to share their scientific research. And so the scientists have always been ahead of the curve 
for the web and trying to figure out how to share information on the web. So I was aware of it for uh, a long time. And uh, in fact, I got on the internet in 1992. Yeah, yeah, back in the gopher days, gopher was super fun. I thought the web kind of looked like a toy at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out why I would want to look at somebody else's vacation photos. So, you know, gopher was way more interesting and that was Invented here at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Was thus the name the gopher. Mm -hmm. uh, but, of course, the web quickly took over all of that. And um, and we wound up becoming a very web-oriented society within a few years. So, Yeah, so you were aware of the web. But then when did you actually start, you know, kind of like linking maybe those childhood memories of code to, yeah. to like actually you know coding on the sure. web? Well, or so, for the web? Yeah, so I had... I had uh, Managed to get myself to Vermont. I was working for a company called Omega Optical that makes filters for microscopes. And uh, they've got filters on Mars. They're in the Mars rovers and that kind of thing. And there was a website that was very important to the scientists who were shopping for filters because, again, scientists knew about the web. And uh, in this company, there was about 100 people. And there was one IT guy. And the one IT guy had to like do all of the tech support for the computers, had to deal with all of the wiring for the internet, and had to take care of the website. Needless to say, it took him forever to get stuff done. So one day, I went on down to rant at him that he still hadn't gotten the new products on the website because it had been six months. And he said, why don't you do it? Like, what do I know about the web? I know nothing at all. So uh, he showed me how to view source for a web page, which, of course, at that point just opened up in Notepad. It was all table-based layout. There was no CSS. Uh, and he showed me how to copy-paste these lines of code and, like, make changes in between for the text. And then I would email him back the, the little files that I created. He would double-check and make sure I hadn't done anything awful. And then he'd put them up online for me. And it was so much fun uh, just in my little hometown of Brattleboro, Vermont, town of 10,000, down the street was the very first uh, master's degree in the country that focused on the internet. So it was the internet strategy, internet strategy management program at Marlboro College. And so I enrolled in that to go get my master's degree. And that is where I got my first, like, really got engaged with writing HTML because there was nothing else at that point in time. It was just HTML, uh, in addition to learning about strategy and marketing and project management and other various aspects of putting together websites. Yeah, so what was coding like, you know, yeah. like in that time period, or That's I awesome. guess with those first couple of jobs or whatever you want, you know, yeah. you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. Well, uh, at this point in time, we're in, in 2000. It was a one-year-long master's degree program. And I graduated in August of 2001. So just, uh, you know, right before the Twin tower Towers fell, right before the whole world changed. Um, so at that point in time, we were working in Macromedia Dreamweaver 3. And we were working with Adobe Photoshop 5.5 and ImageReady 2.0. So ImageReady was responsible for web graphics, and Dreamweaver, of course, was writing our HTML. CSS was a thing. The spec was out there, but none of the browsers supported it. So it was all about IE3 and what IE3 would support in those days. Yeah, it's actually when I got my start was right about around that. Yeah, yeah, about then, because yeah. I was coming more from an art background. I did coding yeah. earlier in the, the 90s, actually, but then... Um, at school, I did a lot of traditional art, and I was like, I want to take this art online and, yeah. and make make things with it. And so, yeah, that was, that was kind of like dragging and dropping into Dreamweaver and then, you know, wanting it to work and so, or, you know, behave the way I wanted to on click and that kind of thing and digging into the actual code view. So Absolutely. it was like right around that, yeah, right yep. around that 2002, yep. 2003 time frame. Yep, yep. So it was a great Dreamweaver time. was a big... It was huge. Yeah, it did the FTP for you to the server and all kinds of other things. So, yeah, it was great. Um, so we would build table-based layouts and, you know, 25 layers of tables and space through GIFs. And, yeah, it was awesome. We could build very, very simple websites. How about the first time you saw CSS or, like, that transition? Yeah, so there used to be... I think it was the W3C maybe, or somebody would put out these little mini classes online. They were all very text-based. 
And uh, they would introduce skills like CSS and JavaScript and uh, other various kinds of things. You could sign up for them. They were like 40 bucks and you could take this little text-based class. And Eric Meyer uh, taught a few of them back in the day. So uh, I got my introduction to CSS and I realized that it was going to be so big because it solved so many problems with layouts and with colors and controlling where things were on the page and uh, being able to have different amount of spacing on each side of that table cell. Because remember, you can set your table cell padding to one number and it would put it on all four sides. That was all you could do in the HTML. So uh, cell padding and cell spacing, right? Yep, yep, I do remember that. Yep, and you had to remember the difference between the two. So, uh, so I realized it was gonna be really big. And the way that I learn is by teaching. So uh, my relationship with Marlboro College at that point in time, because as soon as I graduated, I started teaching at Marlboro, uh, first as a TA and then as a professor. And uh, so I asked Marlboro if I could start running a little like weekend workshop for people who might be interested in learning this new technology. So I set up four Saturdays and uh, a couple of hours each and people came, you know, I'd have 20, 25 people who would just come and sit there and learn CSS with me. And, uh, and it was super fun. So that's how I got into it. But it took a while for CSS to actually get supported by browsers. So yeah, I remember I was on some web forum and they're like, you know, you shouldn't be using tables, you should use this new CSS right. <laughs> syntax. And I was like, why I can, I can just do it with the table so quickly, you know, and it was like so much code to, to get, you know, a layout working properly. And then it didn't really work properly exactly. ever, even though I was like, I'm doing it to the spec, but yeah, yeah those yeah. are some interesting days. PHP developers to this day say, I'd rather stick with my table-based layouts. I understand how they work. <laughs> but so. yeah, CSS has come a long ways for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I know you, you kind of, at least when I met you, you were teaching at, uh, at Harvard Extension School. Could you talk about, you know, I guess, you're talking about you taught at this college and then at some point you, you did you transfer colleges or did you do consulting in between like what what was your path yeah. to to teaching yeah teaching is something or, i've always loved to do and i actually started giving flute lessons when i was in high school okay when i was in college i taught a section of uh, the introductory biology lab because I could do that for credit, it was super fun. Uh, when I got into the working world, I would run workshops for colleagues and, and so forth. So I would talk about microscope filters and uh, talk to the production crew about how the scientists were actually using these filters. So teaching is always something that's always come really naturally to me. Uh, so uh, what the, my very first teaching gig was actually at the Community College of Vermont. So I was getting ready to graduate, but I hadn't quite graduated yet. And they needed somebody to teach introduction to HTML. And that was my very first gig. So that was uh, just before I graduated in July of 2001. And uh, I think I was hooked as much as my students were the very first time they were, we were building our Hello World web page. And uh, the girl in the front row put in the Hello World and, and say, because we had to type it in Notepad and then save it and then try to get it in the browser as a whole thing, trying to get just that workflow going. And she went, wow, it worked. I was like, yes, I'm so proud of my students. And of course, then the next question is, how do we make it red? <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Marlboro hired me, like I said, after I graduated and I uh, eventually worked my way through Marlboro. I was there for about 10 years as an adjunct faculty member, but kind of with a senior status. And I worked as a part of overseeing the Masters of Science in Information Technologies program while I was there. And, uh, and then I got into teaching at LinkedIn Learning. And what I realized about 2012, while I was living in the backwoods of Vermont, New Hampshire, no, and you know, very limited opportunities really, was that I could actually make a living just doing teaching and doing web development on the side. Uh, I, I hadn't believed that that was true prior to that point in time. I figured I'd always have to be a web developer and teaching was something that I could do for fun. But it became clear to me that I was starting to make more income teaching than I did actually doing web development. Hmm. So I realized that I, I could continue to grow this, but I would need to get out of where I was living. So I sold my house. I sold the firm that I was running at that point in time. And that was like a consulting firm or what was it? I or had a like little freelance. Uh, well, it was a, it was a boutique uh, firm. We built Joomla websites called 4Web. Okay. Yep. 
Yeah, we had like five employees. We were All building right. websites. Nice. Yeah. And in Joomla, because that's what we did in those days. Yeah. Uh, I briefly remember the, yeah, the yeah, Joomla yeah. days. Big competitor. It was to, like Drupal, right? Drupal yeah, and WordPress. WordPress eventually obviously won, but Right. Right. Joomla was started off being bigger than WordPress, but then WordPress, of course, ate the world. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I sold all of that, and then I moved to the Boston area, figuring that uh, there are 100 colleges and universities in the Boston area. Somebody would have to hire me. It would never be Harvard. I don't have a PhD. I only have a master's degree. But yet I had a friend who worked at Harvard Extension, and, uh, and he invited me in to be a co-instructor for his class. And that is how I got my foot in the door at Harvard Extension. So I was an adjunct faculty member there for a few years. And then they hired me on in a part-time capacity, which was really great because then I got benefits too. And, um, and I taught five to eight classes a year there at Harvard Extension, uh, which was just fantastic in the digital media program. Really great job. That's awesome. So this whole kind of thread of teaching mm -hmm. uh, well, teaching web development specifically, like how do you feel like teaching has changed over the years? Yeah, so it, it, teaching teaching itself fundamentally, we are humans and there are certain ways that human brains work regardless of the topic that you're teaching. So that part of teaching hasn't changed, but we're getting better about understanding what works well in technology. So um, one of the problems that we have in teaching today is that a lot of people teach technology as, okay, it's, Order is one pixel solid red. Great, go off and build websites uh, because now you know all of the properties and values for CSS. And you forget, you forget all of those properties and values. And honestly, they aren't really all that important. It's a question of how do you connect the properties and values and why do you choose this one versus that one at this particular point in time in your design? Uh, so Thinking bigger is really an important part of web development, coming up with a plan before you start to execute it. And the other part of teaching that people don't do enough of is uh, practice. Because I can't tell you border one pixel solid red and you'll remember it tomorrow. <laughs> you, just, you just won't. Unless you have some kind of mechanism of reinforcing what you've learned. That you can take what you just heard in the lecture and immediately, and immediately apply it to your work, it is just not going to stick with you. So you have to come up with really good uh, projects and ways that people can apply what they have learned. Then the last part of that is transferring what you learn here in this project to the next project. And that even gets less attention. How do you transfer skills from one environment to the next environment? So those are all really important parts of teaching that are, tend to get ignored in our industry. Uh, how about advice for, I don't know, it's, it sounds like you worked with a lot of teaching people earlier in their career. Do you have like advice for people who are earlier in their career, like learning web development and kind of like trying to bridge that gap of, of going from learning to the work professional world? I mean, you must have worked with a lot of folks in that area. Yeah. Yeah. I've worked with a lot of people in the area. Um, uh, the boot camps today seem to think that the best thing to do is introduce people to a little bit of everything. And I'm not sure that that really works necessarily. Uh, I think we all know that your first programming language is the most difficult one to learn. So why are we teaching people five different programming languages that you have to learn JavaScript and, and Rust and Go and whatever else they're teaching these days at the boot camps instead of let's just really focus deeply on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Let's make you a truly a front-end web developer. And we're not going to worry about all of these other programming languages because once you understand the structure of a programming language and the kinds of uh, commands that you can expect, the kinds of uh, structures that you can expect inside of a programming language, you can apply that to your next programming language. Oh yeah, this has variables. Oh yeah, this one has some kind of math function inside of it. You know that that stuff is there, you just can have to look for it and figure out how the syntax is different. But actually thinking about how you solve problems, that is something that's just not getting enough attention in favor of teaching syntax, I think. For sure. So then your advice would be to go deep with the fundamentals. Yes, essentially. absolutely. Um, if you know the fundamentals and you know them well, you can pick anything up along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I think we, we talk about these kind of higher level frameworks. I think 
the first time I met you, uh, I, I don't think you knew that I jumped in, but you were teaching a, a workshop at Fluent yeah. uh, a Conf on, on Bootstrap. Yeah. And it, it was interesting because I, I mean, at the time, I, I don't think I was like super interested in Bootstrap because I wanted to, <laughs> I, I'm always kind of like, I want to build my own custom components and whatever. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, maybe you could talk about like that whole, uh, I don't know, like teaching Bootstrap and, yeah. and what, you know, your thoughts are on, on kind of the frameworks of today and frameworks back then, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Especially in CSS, yeah. Yeah, well, Bootstrap is really uh, an interesting point in time for the for web development in, in, our, in our timeline uh, because that was the, the moment in time we shifted from sort of the before times, before phones, before tablets, before all of the devices and to current times. Bootstrap is very much on that on that pivot. And so prior to Bootstrap, Basically, every website you ever built, you built a custom code base for it. You had no choice. There were no frameworks. There was no uh, code that really that you could reuse a whole lot uh, in those in those uh, various types of layouts. You had to have somebody who really knew CSS in depth in order to put together those kinds of layouts. So if you were coming into this as a PHP developer at that point in time, and you just wanted to make a front end that was passable, there was literally nothing that you could do. So there was a lot of really great PHP developers out there who look like they had just started programming yesterday. That's what their interfaces looked like, even though their mm. back end was absolutely gorgeous, right? Yeah. So uh, Bootstrap gave those back end developers the the uh, first an entry into putting together a passable front end. So that was the first thing that it did. The second thing that happened was. Uh, as we were just starting in the responsive design world when, when Bootstrap was becoming popular, one of the concepts we were playing around with was that 12-column grid layout. And the only way to build a 12-column grid layout at that point in time was with floats. So we had to float all of those things, and then we had to clear them. And I don't know why floats are so difficult for people working in CSS. They don't understand that there is a float. And if you float, you have to clear. But mm -hmm. people don't understand it. They turn on a float, their whole page looks wacky, and then they panic. <laughs> I spend a lot of time teaching floats, telling people not to panic. Don't panic. You can fix it. It's a two-part process, float and then clear. So Bootstrap was really a crutch for a lot of people for doing layouts because they don't understand how float-based layouts work. Obviously, Bootstrap moved on from that and moved into Flexbox later on uh, as, as a mechanism as it got supported by the browser. But at that point in time, Flexbox really wasn't supported by the browser, and you couldn't use it reliably. Remember, we were still very much supporting IE6 back in those days. Oh, yeah. I definitely remember those oh, yeah. days. Yeah, yeah. So, so what intrigued me most about Bootstrap yeah. was, was that it was the first standardized methodology that we had that we could apply to the front end. And we've never had a standardized front-end methodology. We had various kinds of back-end frameworks at that point in time. jQuery was super hot. That was a, th a thing that everybody had started using. But we had nothing for HTML and CSS. So this was our first attempt at how could we start to standardize uh, code rather than building everything custom that was badly documented and no one understood what was going on. So it became a mechanism that we could pass on code bases to succeeding developers and have it res reasonably well understood. Yeah, I think I came into it a little bit before the bootstrap days where, you know, I was the one that was building the custom things. Mm. And I remember the Java developers at the time, yeah, their interfaces were oh, awful. Were horrible, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember my boss coming up to me and he's like, you could make three times more money if you just you know, would code Java all day instead of HTML and CSS. You're good at, right. good at it. And I was I like, remember. no, this is, this is what's important. This is what I think is important. So I took, you know, took that path of HTML and CSS and, and JavaScript and just focusing on the UI, which obviously paid off. But uh, yeah, there, there was definitely that transition where, yeah, we had like the components that you could drop in and everything looked <laughs> the same yeah. for like, yeah. for like four years. And I was like, oh no, this yeah. is, Anyways. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have an animated GIF, I should share this with you, that had all of the different frameworks at the time, just like one after the other, uh, their home pages, they all look exactly identical. Of, of it's like 15 different frameworks. Uh, yeah. Bootstrap was hugely influential on how we were thinking about how websites were supposed to look at that point in time. Yeah, and now we're 
kind of in a similar situation with Tailwind. A lot of the things look the same because they just copy and paste off their UI docs. But I know you can create custom things using it. But anyways, we're... It's kind of flexible. circle of life, yeah, I guess, right, kind of thing right. with, with but development. I, but I think that the takeaway for this, really, is that we've already mentioned Joomla. We mentioned Dreamweaver. We mentioned Joomla. We mentioned uh, Bootstrap. I mentioned jQuery. And people are kind of laughing because who is using these technologies today? What you have to remember is never stake your career on a technology. You have to stake it on HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Those are the base of the browser. That's what the browser supports. You can bank on it supporting that tomorrow. It's going to continue to evolve. HTML will change, CSS will change, JavaScript will change. But if you know those basics, your career will continue. If you set yourself up as, I am the bootstrap person in 2013, mm. you'd probably be unemployed today. Yeah, true. So you're, you're always going to have to pivot in this industry. So that would be a, a really big thing for people who are starting their careers to know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, I think that's where you and I, you know, obviously connect a lot is yeah. the fundamentals and like, yep. you know, writing really good HTML and CSS will work, you know, great today and great Rick in the tomorrow. future. Yeah, and same thing with JavaScript as well. You know, right. so. My websites from 2001 are still display just fine. You'll laugh at them, but they still display. Yeah, and they'll actually be faster and faster and faster they over will. time. <laughs> They're very, very fast. <laughs> yeah, and with that, uh, your most popular course on Front of Masters is the CSS Grid and, and Flexbox course. Yep. Um, what, you know, of course, that's deep fundamentals, but what would you say, like, your favorite course that you've taught is? Because there's, there's lots, you know, I mean, you've taught now, what, six, seven courses? Yeah. Um, which one would you say is your favorite? Gosh, there's, there's so many. Um, the, the practical CSS layouts was super fun for me to put together. Yeah, so that was recently. It was like six months ago or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I had to put, I put that one together. I had a little JavaScript in it. Uh, the layouts that I got from the graphic designer were really whacked out. So for me personally, that was a lot of fun. But I have to say, uh, teaching beginners is really where I love uh, the, the process. Even though the code is really super simple and it, it's, it's not difficult for me to do, it's not personally challenging, knowing that I am helping people get off on the right foot and watching them integrate what I'm saying and be able to apply it is uh, very satisfying. So I have to say, like, the boot camp was, was awesome. Yeah, I mean, not a lot of people know that we did that boot camp, so... Uh, yeah, for, and that I, still works. Yeah, for everybody, you know, watching, it's frontofmasters.com slash bootcamp. Mm -hmm. It's completely free, two weeks. And um, it's kind of meant to, the way we pitched it and the way it works is like your first steps with code, like to see if, if this is even interesting, like this field is even interesting to you. Right. That's kind of how we pitched it because it's like free material, we don't want you to pay for the service at this point. Like mm -hmm. you should just take something free, see if you like it. And then we found that people, even uh, that free boot camp that we did, even that was like too challenging for people for beginners. Right. So we created the Internet Fundamentals right. course, which is also still out there, right? So yeah, the, and still up to date. Yeah, it's, it's internetfundamentals.com. So, yep. but yeah, it's it's surprising. I mean, we've had. Over like a hundred thousand people, you know, at least start the program. I'm not exactly sure what how many finished, of course, mm -hmm. but um, but yeah, have you had anybody like reach out to you from that, you know, kind of path? To kind of talk about um, yeah, their experience. Yeah, I, I sometimes I get um, e uh, notes from people on Twitter or or from LinkedIn saying I'd really like to connect with you. You really helped me understand HTML or CSS. Uh, and that is, that's always very satisfying to have people tell you that. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit here and there. Less than I used to, but... Uh, yeah, because yeah. we launched it like two years ago, yeah. right? So. Well, 2018, I think. Oh, was it really yeah. that long ago? Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, well, we'll have to do a refresher and and promote it again at some point. Yeah. But, but yeah, that was, that was really, really fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then how about like tips for people thinking about getting into teaching? I know you've you know, kind of been in teaching for a long time, but like, 
yeah, maybe some tips of people who are I'm thinking about teaching or or why would I even want to get into teaching? Right, right. Uh, well, first of all, you'll never get rich teaching. So don't don't think that this is a way to fabulous wealth. <laughs> you have to really just d have a deep desire to help people uh, to become a teacher. You have to have uh, empathy with people who are basically making themselves vulnerable. They're trying to learn something new. They are putting themselves out there. They have no idea if they're doing it right or wrong. Uh, so you, you have to be very gentle with people and you have to be respectful of feelings, right? So don't be that person who's like, I can't believe you don't understand border one pixel solid red. No, we have to understand that there's ways people think about problems and you need to adjust your teaching to fit their so-called their mental model. How do they think the world works and how can you adjust your message to jive with whatever it is that, that they are thinking at that moment in time? Um, oddly, I never had official class on a, a class on teaching until I was at Harvard Extension. <laughs> I could take classes for $40 each. So I finally took an instructional design class. I finally took a class on adult learning pedagogy and so forth. Um, and they were just completely eye-opening for me and completely obvious at the same time. So uh, one of the things that, that I loved was the, the concept of um, so-called backwards design for teaching. And uh, it, there's a book that's written called Understanding, uh, Understanding by Design that talks about this concept of backwards teaching. And the idea is that usually when you have a teacher, they will say something like, it's fall in New England and the apples are growing on the trees. Let's take my first graders to the apple orchards to pick apples because it would be nice to be outside. Uh, yeah, we'll make it into a unit by throwing some apples in the math. We'll count ma apples at math class and we'll sing the Johnny Appleseed song and we're done. As opposed to starting with a question like, what, what do first graders not understand about apples? So, for example, do first graders understand that apples don't spring fully formed from the grocery store bins? Where do apples actually come from? So... If you start with that as a question and then work your way backwards, you can say like, well, what I'd like uh, students to know walking away is apples grow in an orchard and they have to get picked and they have to be on a truck and they have to go to a grocery store, that kind of thing. Other apples are cut and turned into pies. That, those kinds of basics, a first grader may not know. So how do we construct then, a, uh, uh, first of all, the goal of your teaching how do we construct an assessment to see that you've gotten to your goal? How do we create lessons to support that assessment? And then how, how does that whole thing get put together into your teaching? Which kind of sounds like UX. And I remember reading this book and like the whole way through, I was like, this is just UX. This is what we do in UX. So there are a lot of parallels between UX and, and the concept of backwards design in teaching. So starting with the end in mind. And, and working your way backwards and uh, constructing your lessons from that. So that would be my biggest advice to people. If they start teaching rather than like, I'm going to teach Flexbox. Let's start with you know, <laughs> display flex. Why don't we start with, I want to teach people how to make a flexible layout that works across devices. Now, how do we solve, solve for that and, and work your way backwards? It's great advice. Yeah. It, you were talking about uh, not getting into it to get rich. It's, it's funny because <laughs> I was just thinking about the, the early days when I was like, okay, I really care. Or the reason why I kept getting hired on these big projects, at, at some point I realized it was because I taught everyone around me. Like right. I always was educating everyone around me. Yep. And at, at the point, I was like trying to search for meaning in my life. And I was like, okay, I think that I'm going to dedicate the rest of my career to, to teaching, really. And I didn't know what that would look like. <laughs> you know, do I become an adjunct instructor? And, you know, of course, like with, with having, you know, some business skills, I've launched businesses in the past. So I was able to make this work mm -hmm. where it financially works for us. Right. You know, a, right. a lot of us actually. But right. um, yeah. Yeah. Like starting with that, like uh, that desire to uh, to really like elevate those around you, and l like you said, start with the the question of like what are we actually trying to learn here, and then how do we create 
a path to get there for everyone. Exactly. And I think that that's, yeah, that's ultimately, like, it's, we could wrap up front of masters into a, you know, mission statement or something. I think that would be right. probably what it is and why, you know, why we're continue to work together years and years and years. Exactly. So. Exactly. I passionately want to have people be able to say what they want to say online. And however it is that they get there to do that works for me. So here at Front End Masters, we talk about code. In other places, I teach various kinds of no-code tools uh, for people who may not, the coding isn't a focus of their life. They're, they do other things in real life, but yet they need a website. And um, I try to help them in other ways as well. Yeah. Can we talk more about that? Sure. I think that's kind of like uh, your current arc right (laughs) career arc or whatever if you will you know you you've kind of like uh been getting more into these no code tools and and teaching no code tools so can you talk about the 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 landscape there like what it looks like yeah yeah and the tools that you're excited about yeah watch out because the no code tools are coming and they're they're going to solve a lot of problems for a lot of people so uh, the first thing to remember about no code tools is is that you should not see them as threatening to your career as a programmer because my goodness, we are going to need programmers. Uh, The problem is we just don't have enough of them and we don't have budgets necessarily for all of them. Uh, Everything from uh, you, you probably already do some kinds of no code automations. Uh, For example, you have Slack most likely in your workplace. Uh, You have social media in your workplace. Maybe you're using Trello cards in your workplace. There's a whole bunch of different tools that people are using now, email, of course. And maybe you just need an automated way of moving whatever through the system, Um, getting approvals for for, uh, budgetary kinds of things or some sort of workflow. And no-code tools are actually used, right, to move things between systems and, uh, and, and build some kind of system where you can track your workflows. I mean, that, that is a no-code tool that's very simplest. Excel is a no-code tool, right? It's a database, a one-dimensional database, but it can be a database, right? Well, Excel is super powerful. Exactly. To this day, but Google Sheets, et cetera. But yeah, yep, all no-code tools. So what are some of the more popular no code tools then if say I have data in these disparate places and I need to maybe make a website that displays this data or connect them together like what what tools would you recommend people look into or so there are big four that I think that kind of encompass the space because of course there are like a million of these no code tools right now they're all VC funded they're you know all have three people working at them uh, but there's four really big ones that I think you ought to be paying attention to so the first one is webflow webflow is the new dream lever it's going to allow people to build front ends of websites uh, without code it's not really focused so much on javascript although there is a little bit of like animation and a little bit of additional javascript you can put in place although it's not called JavaScript. Uh, what is it called? Uh, interactions or something okay. like that. Yeah, we, we don't use scary words in, in no sure. code tools. Interact- the databases are not databases. They're called bases or collections or something else. Uh, uh, Webflow is really fantastic. We can talk more about that. I, I'm really intrigued with what Webflow is doing. Uh, I wonder but, how it's different from like, you know, Dreamweaver. Dreamweaver oh. kind of, we talked about, it got us both into the industry in some way or shape or the other. It was, right. it was a really fun way to like create something, but when you wanted it to work properly, you had to obviously go in the code view. Like how is it different today? You know, something like a Webflow, like, or really Squarespace or any of these, like how, how are things different today that, that they, you don't think that they'll just go away or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, okay. We can compare Squarespace and OneFlow that, yeah. Uh, Squarespace is is more locked down. You're very limited in, as to what you can do inside of Squarespace. If you're a developer, you look at that and say, well, why can't I do the thing? And uh, one of my favorite rants is, is Squarespace offers you the box. It says custom CSS, write it here. 
and it gives you no help whatsoever as to knowing where your classes are, your structure of your document or anything else. So it's literally a square. It is literally a square where you can type space. anything. And, well, yes. rectangle, technically, a little rectangle. Yeah. And a lot of tools you'll find a similar box, you know, because this is the custom CSS box, but it gives you no help and they don't want to like, they don't want to make a big deal out of it. They don't want to provide any technical support on it. So once you wind up in Squarespace, you wind up going into DevTools and you wind up tracking down whatever it is you're trying to style and forming your selectors that way and then and styling accordingly into your box. Um, with Webflow, it's designed to be really open and flexible, but they don't give you access to any code. So you can't actually write HTML. You can't hmm. actually write CSS. Hmm. It writes it all for you. Hmm. And there's various annoyances for me in there. So you know how I love weird selectors. I don't have access to any weird selectors there. Uh, I don't have a lot of access to uh, anything beyond like a lot of classes and so forth. Um, I know there's a lot of buttons to click in order to do layouts and so forth. So I'm really intrigued with how people are starting to think about CSS from that visual perspective hmm. and building CSS from, from all the buttons that you have in an interface like Webflow. Got it. As opposed to learning it from the code perspective. So you can't, you can or can't actually take that code and like write things custom from there. Uh, there is a way you can export the HTML okay, and CSS. Yeah. So uh, we could have a workflow here. I can build a page in Webflow. I can export the HTML and CSS and hand it over to you. Got it. And then you can now build on your JavaScript and backend, whatever, sure. and everything. So it can basically be a Pipeline a code editor, or something, yeah. A code editor. Yeah, I just wrote, wrote this thing and handed it off to the next person. Uh, I can also just build a basic website because uh, I'm, I'm building websites for scientists these days yeah. and, and research labs. It's like tying back to the... Back to my biology days. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. All That's the cool, cool cell pictures and everything. So uh, so you're using Webflow today to actually build websites for these researchers. Yeah, for these researchers oh, who, want, cool. who want to really customize high-end kind of look to their site huh. better than you can get with Squarespace. Is that like to get funding for their research or? Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And, and community, uh, recruit so they graduate do want students. it to look, yeah, yep. look nice. They want whatever. it to look nice yeah. and tracks more money, uh, to be honest. But um, the other part of it, of course, is that by doing it in Webflow is that these researchers can go in and make their own edits to the web page. Mm which they wouldn't be able to do if I built it in raw HTML and CSS. Well, we've had a million different attempts at this, right? With like, is it Adobe Contribute or something? Contribute. Uh, contribute. Right. Macromedia or, uh, Contribute. Yeah, yes. Macromedia Contribute. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was Macromedia. It was macromedia. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It was Those awesome. Those were the days. Yeah. Like, I, when I, whenever I see like an old Macromedia logo, yeah. I just like get the warm fuzzies. Because it was I, like, was it was a, a great... disc. And like, you know, I could have like fireworks. Yeah. Remember fireworks? It was oh, like yeah. the best. Awesome. Because it was like not so powerful as like Illustrator, but it was like, I could do exactly the graphic editing that I wanted to. Like yep. exactly that yep. level. And seeing Anyways, this passing back and forth. Great. Oh yeah, it was, it was great. But I think we didn't get to all the other types of known code, <laughs> code tools. We got hung up on Webflow because obviously yeah. it's a so Webflow is super cool. We're, we're UI yeah. people, so yeah. I'm yeah. all excited about it. But anyways, yeah. what's the the next so, set of tools? So uh, Webflow does have built into it a so-called collection, so I can set up like repeating, like for example, let's say we have a team of people, everybody has a name and a and a position and a picture and so forth. So you can set up a little collection there. So very lightweight kind of database. Mm. But if you want a heavier database and have your information display on Webflow, you're going to need a uh, something more substantial than what Webflow offers. And so Airtable is the thing that a lot of people are using for databases in the code world. So it's like a online Excel, right? It's kind of like Excel, but it is in fact a database like with joins and, and you can have. Yeah, we actually we've used it at Front of Masters for um, like, collecting addresses sure. and putting it into you it has know, a form that you yeah as like a form yep. builder or whatever yep yep and also collecting information with uh nonprofits wanting to work with us that kind of thing we've yep we've made some like forms that go into Airtable and then yeah exactly yeah and then you can create like views on that data yep Exactly. So, yeah, that's that's how we set up that. Exactly. Yeah, Airtable has an API that's really straightforward, and and no code tools will plug into that API. So like you could connect, you could power like a, a Webflow website with 
Airtable then? Yep. You can have Airtable behind uh, your hmm. Webflow site. So, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. So um, Airtable is really big for, with a lot of different no-code tools for that reason. And then uh, there's Zapier, which is Z-A-P-I-E-R. Zapier makes you happier. And it, I think of it, I call it an, a meta API. So if you have disparate APIs all over, you need a way of connecting them and a, a series of things to execute, Zapier does it no code you know, picture, picture oriented kind of thing. So, uh, for example, I, I write a blog post in Google docs. When I put that blog post into a certain folder, I can have it connect to my WordPress site and it knows what to take for the title and what to take for the main body of that blog post. It can publish that. It can also take a certain part of that document and send it to Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now. And maybe, well, maybe we can't do this anymore. We used to be able to do it. I don't know about the API these days, but anyway, you used to be able to send it to Twitter or Facebook or whatever, uh, just by dragging your document into a certain folder uh, in, on Drive in Google. Yeah, so. I think I've done a zap or whatever they call it. They, they call them zaps, right? Yeah, because yeah. we don't want to be... It's like if I drop an image, it would send... Like an image in a folder, it would yeah. send an email or something. I can't remember exactly, exactly. what I... What I used it for but there was a period of time where it's like i just need to wire something together between two apis and exactly i, I just uh, and it, it was Basecamp was another integration that i used yeah at yeah. the time but yeah slack trello all the yeah all the so they have like things. automations oh so yeah that, so that's the third type so you have website builder right. database Base. automations, automations that make everything talk to each other and then the last one i will really watch very carefully and this audience will really love is called bubble they're at bubble.io and they are actually like uh, true coding, hmm. uh, but visually. <laughs> and we don't mean like visual, like visual basic. We mean, you know, drag and drop uh, style coding. So um, I have put together, for example, uh, just, just as an example, a little app, I made a grocery store app. So I could make a list of things that I wanted to buy at the grocery store. I could remember those things for the next time I go to the grocery store. I could take, put things on, take things off the list. Uh, I could have other people log on, add to the list, log on, and make their own grocery lists. Um, so that that kind of thing, it's a it's an actual real application. It's kind of like an app building platform. Very much an app building platform. Um, the weakness with Bubble is the the UI for it really isn't all that good. They only just added Flexbox to it. I don't think they have Grid yet. Uh, a lot of the Bubble apps don't really look all that great, but the backend stuff is pretty phenomenal. So you can have your database and you can have it displaying, storing information, displaying information, pulling in APIs from different places, uh, uh, doing all kinds of various mashups of, of things. Hmm. Uh, so it, uh, and so I'd recommend if you're really wanting to look at the future of no code bubble is a really good one to take a look at. And of course it has a, a free version. You can just check out. Of course, when I'm hearing like all of these new names and yeah. apps and software, I, I think about like what happens when the company gets bought out and shut down like, there you go. Yep. or whatever. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I think going back to maybe some of the things we said, like frameworks change all the time. Absolutely. These tools change a lot. So like, how do you avoid, being like sort of locked in or you know what I mean stuck yeah well I mean that is always one of the most important things is it as you start to investigate tools like how do I get my data out mm. you, you need to know that answer before you ever commit to any of these tools how do I get my data out uh, and what's going to happen when it gets sold to somebody else uh, the reason I mentioned these four is that they seem to be they're four of the more longer lived versions of no code tools, which means they might've been around for 10 years, maybe, or just under 10 years. Mm. Uh, and they uh, t tend to have a lot of name recognition in the no code space. Mm. Uh, so I would worry less about them like going under, which is not sure. true of a lot of no code tools. Uh, but at the same yeah. time, we, I think we should be concerned about these getting bought, you know? Yeah. It's, it's Seems like every day on Twitter, there's a new like, yeah. check out this amazing automation or whatever. And it's a tool you've never seen and it right. links to a landing page or right. email right. capture form or whatever. I don't right. know. Right, right. So like Webflow has got all these imitators that are coming along. So yeah. there's Web Web Studio, I think it is. It's like an open source version of it. And there's, you know, Flutter and, and uh, 
other various competitors, Doric. There's a bunch of them. Yeah, a interesting bit of history with Webflow. Like I, I think when I first saw the demo, I actually played with it a bit, and I, I was like, wow, this is like a modern Dreamweaver. And I said that on Twitter, and they used my quote like uh -huh. on their like actual sign up page right. for years. Yeah. <laughs> and it said like uh, creator of jQuery UI, I think it was or something like that, which I I'm not the creator of jQuery right. UI. Yeah. There was a little misattribution there, but that's that some funny history. I was the creator of the jQuery UI date picker. So it was like close enough. I didn't really like <laughs> write in like, ah, oh. yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. Cause most, I don't think, most of their audience would know the difference. <laughs> no, no, probably but not. Anyways, it's but, a but fun the, bit the, of history. Oh yeah, absolutely. The, the, the important was, thing about Webflow was that it solved this problem where we had, where Dreamweaver was a thing. And it honestly, we all know Dreamweaver just didn't keep up with the times. We wound up with this chunk of time for designers where it was all about the content management system. There was that sort of period maybe between like, I don't know, 2008 and maybe really like 2016. 2017 even, where if you wanted to be a designer working on the front end, you were going to be coding, you were going to be working in WordPress, or you were modifying WordPress templates or something like that. You weren't ever able to really do anything on your own. Um, maybe you had Figma. I mean, but, but that is as far as it got. Webflow is finally like, you can actually make a thing uh, without having to know code. And you can make it beautiful and make it look exactly the way you want. We really haven't had anything like that since Dreamweaver. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, what, yeah, you were, you mentioned WordPress mm -hmm. and a lot of like, the thing I, I like about WordPress is it's kind of almost like a bridge between the no code and the code world Absolutely. because everything is actually code, right? Like right. the PHP, you can do anything with it. It's your code. It's your right. site. You own it. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what worries me, I guess. I, you know, I just asked about the data, or we talked about the data export, but yeah, I like that about WordPress, where right. it's like you get a lot of these no code tools and even some of the automations as plugins and right. these kinds of things. Um, but you own it, and right. But also you have to maintain it and <laughs> right. upgrades, and sometimes you can get stuck in an old version, and then you can get hacked, and right. so there's there's all of those things that you have to worry about too. But. Exactly, exactly. And so you have to remember who is who is your target audience. So uh, WordPress was revolutionary in 2008, 2009, 2010 for people who wanted to make changes on their own website. That was an easy interface in those days for people yeah. who wanted to update their own content. Uh, without having to hire somebody to update it for them. Mm -hmm. Now, today, it's pretty much the same interface. And everybody is like, but this is really hard. I don't understand what's going on. Hmm. Uh, because so many other tools have become so much easier to use. That's true. The UX has gotten much better. Continue to evolve. Yeah. yeah. So, so again, if you're a developer, you probably don't really want to live in developer land without knowing code. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really should know code. Uh, but it depends on the problem that you're trying to solve and where the focus of your career actually is yeah. uh, as to how far into these t other kinds of tools that you want to get. As I said, my main goal is I want to teach everybody about how they can talk on the web and put their own ideas out for everybody yeah. to see. You want to sort of empower the most people everybody, possible. Yeah. Everybody and however they're going to do it. And yeah. I, I'm not saying that you developers really should like, give up development and go to no code because obviously there's a lot of code in no code. Uh, but if you are a furniture salesman, I think Squarespace is a wonderful solution for you. Mm -hmm. and I think that would be a great way for you to talk about your furniture sales. I don't know why I picked furniture sales, but anyway. Yeah. 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 So like as a developer, like yeah. how should we think about like these no code tools. I think you ought to think about them exactly. It, it's the same problem that we had back in the day when Contribute first came out. I don't know if you remember this. There was a world prior to Contribute where it was just the Dreamweaver world. And so if somebody found a typo on their site, they would have to pick up the phone and call me. And they called. They didn't email. They would pick up the phone and call me and say, Jen, that's there's a misspelling. I need you to fix it. And I would have to open up Dreamweaver and find it. Da, 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 da. When Contribute came along, they didn't have to call me anymore. Mm. They could get in themselves and they could fix all the typos it's true. and make changes to the text. Yeah. But what happened was all the freelancers at that point in time 
we all screamed bloody murder. Oh my gosh, this is the end of it. We're never going to make any money on this anymore. Everybody can make their own changes. This is really terrible. What it actually did was it freed us up to do more interesting development. Because we weren't bogged down in typos anymore. Mm. Now we could build more websites because mm. there's still only so many hours in the day. So no code tools actually wind up solving these super basic things that you as a developer really don't want to do. Because as a developer, you want to develop new things that are interesting and engaging. You don't want to write an automation system for getting bills paid at your company. You just don't. <laughs> yeah. So your no-code tools will allow that sort of skunk works thing to happen at your company where people can solve their, their one tiny problem for which there are three people in the world who care about that problem. But it makes a huge difference to them. They can solve that problem with no-code tools. Mm -hmm. And you as a developer are freed up to deal with the millions of people who are visiting your website, which is a far more interesting problem to be dealing with. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm thinking about you know being at a larger company, for instance, and the, the sales team comes to me and says like, we need you to build this custom app for our sales team. It's like, exactly. you could think about it like, oh, okay, maybe they could use Bubble and just like prove out what the workflow is or exactly. something like that yep. as a prototype. And then yep. be like, okay, now you actually have something real that works. Yeah. Like maybe that's good enough. It but, might be but, good enough. But if we want to scale this, okay, exactly. now we actually have a prototype or we have like something real that we can talk about where, yeah, it's interesting. I haven't really thought about that too much. That is, that is actually one of the, the big uh, target audiences are non-technical founders mm. who want, who, who maybe don't necessarily want to bring on a technical partner yet, just want to do a proof of concept so they can build things out in no code yeah. and, uh, and, and have something to show to the VCs. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think about all the different, mm. <laughs> this is like PTSD, right? Where, right? where you have like a lot of, you know, these kind of non-technical founders saying like, oh, could you build me this app? Could you build me this app or whatever? And it's like, my advice to them today is, yeah, I, I, I'll probably point them at some of these services you mentioned, but yeah. but my advice was always um, over the last five or ten years, really, is like, how much can you get by just right. with Google Sheets? Exactly. Like, can you build this idea out and sell it and get some money from your customer using just Google Sheets? And yeah. they think like, you know, they get kind of frustrated because it's like it puts it back in their court of like, you know. Now you go build the business instead of saying like, oh, I need the developers to do all this work before I can actually prove out my idea. It's like, mm -hmm. no, uh, that, that uh, yeah, as a founder myself, other founders obviously ask and these kinds of questions. And I'm always like, how far can you get with <laughs> Google Sheets and talking to the customer? And can you get at least 100 people to give you a credit card? Because if you can't, it shouldn't, it's why would a developer bother working with you? You're absolutely right. Um, in fact, you can find online training for exactly that, uh, where you could use something like Glide. Uh, mm. Glide is a, a something that hooks up to Google Sheets and it gives you a, even a starting front end. Like mm. if you want some some basic kinds of uh, apps, they've already got them all pre-built for you. You can customize them and they'll talk to Google Sheets. Uh, sometimes you might be building an app for 100 people in the world. And if you're charging 100 people in the world 50 bucks a month to use your app and it solves all their problems, that may still be a great living for you mm -hmm. uh, as a no-code founder. So remember that not everything has to scale. When you're not hiring programmers for <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can, in fact, build your app for your tiny little slice of the world. At a, at a larger subscription price because it's hard to make money at 99 cents in the in the app store yeah. uh, but if but if you have that small group of people who really desperately need a problem solved and you can build it in a no-code tool you might be able to make a really nice side hustle out of that yeah absolutely i mean i think about actually i've been thinking about this a lot lately mm -hmm. where you have these restaurants that mm -hmm. are like a mom pa restaurant right and they serve really high quality food. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like, they're not, their margins aren't great there. Right. They're kind of probably barely eking by beyond the scenes, but they've yep. been there for right. years and years and years because they, they just focus on quality and, and the same servers and the same cooks. And so, you know, it's like, uh, like not everything has to be this sort of like McDonald's, you know, to, to go scale the world right. and like, you know, okay, 
you know, there's a new emerging market. We got to be there for, you know, it's, right. it's, it's like, uh, you know, you can have like a high quality, you know, product and, and yeah, maybe, maybe that family, like it's a family and they make enough, you know, to serve, not just survive, but like maybe they make a great living off of that restaurant and it's high quality food. And I think about that actually quite a, a bit. Like, I feel like we need more of that yes. in the world, like right. more of, you know, some unique place that we can go to with, with high quality, you know, that's catered to like a specific, you know, in this case type of food, but you know, you're thinking about software, you're like, no, this caters to these you know, maybe it's a hundred or a couple hundred or a couple thousand, like you're talking about researchers or right. whatever. It's like, no, it fits this, this niche, Yep. you know, niche, like a glove. And yep. like, it really makes a big impact because obviously, you know, researchers can yeah. make a huge impact on our world. And Absolutely. so it's like, why not tackle a small problem with, with a, you know, high quality, but you don't have to like make buko buko bucks or whatever right. like on every event like i don't know this whole get vc money vc money and scale being the only option i think there's there's other options there are other options yeah i mean if you, if you made a hundred million dollars i mean could you really burn through that in your lifetime how much is enough how much is enough That's how much is enough it's a good uh it's a good question do you have to measure your success by money yeah yeah, I, think I have to say I'm very satisfied with what I do for work. Yeah, that's very cool. Like tying in, yeah, the I the, love my job. The biology, yeah, or the yeah, or the science science yeah. background into uh, two things together using yeah. web tools. Yeah, uh, that's that's awesome. Yeah. So with that, like, do you have any um, anything on your horizon, like career wise or personal? Like, is it more of what you're doing, or is there anything like on the horizon that you're like really excited about? Well, you know, I, I continue to watch what's happening in the space and, and see what I think is going to stick and, and continue to go. I'm excited about coming back here next year. We're going to be revising our Flexbox and Grid course again. we got to put in some stuff about container queries and subgrid. And so I've got new things to learn in those in those fears. Uh, we're talking about reworking and getting started with CSS here at Front of Masters. Yeah. And uh, I'm really excited about that, And yeah, we talked about, like, we have this new quiz Base system and ah, doing some interactive, fantastic kind of things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, things like that to help reinforce learning um, are always really exciting to do. Um, yeah. So, but I, as I said, I'm really happy with where I am. I love teaching. Uh, I love watching what's going on on the horizon. Uh, I, I think obviously I think a lot about like. So what is the impact of these new technologies on the space that we're in right now? You have to be aware that everything is constantly changing. Uh, so I continue to watch the no-code space uh, and and continue to have fun in that in that arena as well. Love yeah, I think you recently shared that you went full time on this course creating thing, right? Well, that, or yeah, I, I, about two thirds of my time is spent. Uh, creating courses okay. and about a third of my time is spent making these web flow sites for scientists. Okay. Yeah. 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 Which is, it's a good balance. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome that you're able to, to make that work and yeah. kind of cross over again. That, that's recent, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is all pretty recent. It's, it's always for me, I've, I've been a freelancer for 23 years now. And so it's always just a mix of like whatever it is that I'm doing and what I, I started with, lots of little clients and now it really i just sort of have three big clients and uh, mm, yeah. you know two teaching clients and and one um, for building webflow sites and that mix is working for me at the moment yeah who knows what happens next yeah i, f I feel like there was a time period where i was you know really freelancing or consulting or whatever you want to call it where i was working on a ton of different things and i found like finding that project that's like a really good match or right. like it's like okay no this uh, I'm willing to work on this for a long period of time. It was always like more right. fulfilling than right. than doing like a a ton of small things, I guess. Exactly. Well, and I'm running an agency for the scientist website, so uh, there's a team that's going out and dealing with finding the work and getting the content and getting the designs. I just get everything at the end, which is okay. Perfect. I, I perfect. Love it. You can focus on the I implementation. Just focus on implementation. Exactly. Very I love cool. It. Yeah. How about like? Uh, well, personally or professionally, do you have any like uh, 
I don't know, fun bucket list type things. I don't know. We always kind of like Brian's was uh, snowboarding in the Alps or whatever. Like, yeah. Like, do you have anything like that? Like yeah. travel or? Yeah. Well, uh, a lot of people talk about van life. Um, I, I am not probably going to get a van, but I, I have a, a Honda CRV and I recently discovered that there is a way that you can stick a bed in the back of it and a uh, refrigerator and uh, just sort of basic basics. And, um, so I, I have several road trips that I am very interested in doing. Uh, probably one of those people that want to try to get to as many national parks as I can. I, I love Canada. I just really love visiting Canada and uh, their national parks are really fantastic. So I'm probably more of an on the road kind of person in the United States and in Canada. Yeah. I think, uh, one of our other instructors, Paul Boyg, actually did that with his wife over the uh, last like year. Nice. When you hit up all the national parks, it's like, oh, he has the photos. Yeah. <laughs> He's so jealous. Yeah, yeah. And it's like every photo is him smiling very large. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I, yeah, I would say I'd share that. I share that uh, dream someday, like to travel. Yeah, yeah. To uh, to the well, especially national parks. Yeah. Exactly. Because exactly. it's just something about nature and walking through nature and Absolutely. seeing those landscapes. Yep. Um, yep. Definitely elevates the mood for sure. Yep. So i probably do that with my wife. Yep. On someday. the list for next year. <laughs> On the, not, no, for me, it's probably when the kids are quite a bit older. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but that's okay. But yeah. Yeah. Or do it with them, I guess. Yeah. S someday. We'll, Absolutely. We'll see. Um, how about like just general themes? I think... Um, you know, that tie your career together. And, um, like, I know you kind of talked about teaching really is the, the essence of it, but, um, I don't know. Do you have any <laughs> parting words around yeah. like your career and, and, uh, and teaching? Yeah. Uh, so what I would say is teaching is in everything, whether you're, if, even if you're talking to a freelance client, who's wanting to build a website, uh, my favorite example, my favorite phone call ever was the person who picked up the phone and said, hi, is this Jen? I said, yes, it is. Hi, I'm whoever it was. I would like a website and I'd like it blue. How much will that cost? <laughs> okay, well, let's start by educating you. <laughs> what you need to know besides blue. Uh, and um, uh, so there's there's teaching is, is everywhere. And uh, I, I would just encourage everybody to take that extra beat, try to understand the person that you're talking to, have empathy with them for where they're coming from, and um, and be kind in return. Let's see where it gets you. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up. So <laughs> appreciate your time, Jen. Yeah, great to talk to you, Mark. Hey there, before you go, don't forget we're new at this. So any feedback, whether it's a like or subscribe, we'll take those or a comment about what you didn't like or what you'd like to see more of in the future. We'll definitely incorporate that into the next episodes. Uh, I'm really enjoying these conversations. So any type of feedback would be fantastic and especially sharing it with your friends and colleagues. So really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. See you in the next one.